Uh, sequester is supposed to hit where automatic cuts take place based upon the discussion that happened last summer about the uh, raising the federal debt ceiling. The federal debt ceiling that agreement that occurred last summer has to be raised by the end of January. And in addition, uh, we have some changes in the level of debt and bond indebtedness, uh, not only at the subnational level for states, but the general deficit level for the United States, all of which happened in that January time frame. After the election, Congress has nine or ten working days to solve this problem, which means they're going to have to be in session longer than that. Let's double that number. Let's say it's 18 to 20 days, which means something is going to be done about the sequester, about the fiscal cliff between the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th day. It's not going to occur before that. But currently, there are only nine or ten working days after the election for Congress to deal with this problem. That's a heavy lift and, a, and very difficult to do in a very short period of time. So there's a lot coming together on this election, and there's a lot affecting what happens after the election. And this is partly for the title, thanks, Doc, again, about you win the election, what happens in terms of governing? And there's a fundamental divide that scholars have about the talents that it takes to win and run, run for office and win, and what it actually takes to make the government work. And this is going to collide very quickly in that nine to ten working days that Congress has to deal with the fiscal cliff, the Bush tax cuts, changes in the deficit, and the level of deficit for the country. All right, so let's uh, look at President uh, Obama's re-election prospects. I know you want this right up front. Uh, we'll get this right up front. We'll keep in mind what we know and what we don't know. We don't think, for example, that debates matter. Whoops. We don't think that foreign policy matters. Whoops. Okay? Those two things matter. It's very clear those two things matter. I'm a data-driven political scientist. I'll show you the data. They matter. But they're not in our models. We also don't think that campaigns matter as well. We think that you can look at the pocketbook, and you can look at Gallup presidential approval and make a prediction in June or July about who's going to win the election. We don't think campaigns matter. Clearly they do. So we don't get all upset about mammoth amounts of uh, campaign spending, just as an example. Just an example. But we also don't measure very well the level of anger, angst, the, the dichotomy between us versus them what typically is portrayed in the media as red versus blue. We don't deal very well with that as well in our models. So there are several things that we don't deal with in political science models. I'll talk about these, but I just want you to know that the models we put forward are generally pocketbook models that don't deal with the difficulties of red versus blue or with campaigns themselves. We can look at uh, the different qualifiers and rules around elections. We only have 16 observations. 16 observations that are like this election, and 70% of the time, the president wins re-election. 70% of the time. So that's a great place to be if you're the incumbent. Great place to be. We can look at the congressional and U.S. Senate picture for what happens. There are 94 competitive House seats, but of those 94 competitive House seats, 66 are seats held by Democrats in districts that John McCain won in 2008. 66. Those are red seats. There's no question about it. A third of those 66 seats have seen Democratic members retire, go away, decide not to run for re-election for whatever reason, because they were reading the tea leaves in terms of what was happening in their districts. So Republicans are going to be able to hold the House just by the nature of looking at those very competitive 66 House seats, and even if we cut that down a little bit. So this, this will be an important development we can look at, as well as the four epic U.S. Senate battles. Uh, what's happening in Massachusetts, obviously, is important. What happens to Senator Tester in Montana? What happens in Nevada, for example, uh, and Virginia? We probably don't have time to do California ballot measures and what's happening regionally or locally, but we'll keep that in mind as we look at uh, the questions and answers. I have data on this I can show you. Uh, I, I don't generally argue for something. But Proposition 30 is absolutely critical to education. Let me just say, it's absolutely critical to education. So if you want to talk about Proposition 30, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I don't typically advocate for things, but it's absolutely critical for the future of education. And it's in trouble. It's in trouble. And I'll explain why. Uh, I've explained this to people when I was at the GMC uh, gala, talking to all the politicians, and they all want to know what's happening with Proposition 30. And I explained the difficulties that Proposition 30 has. We can talk about that and the machinations if you want. 
uh, behind 30 and 38 and other ballot measures uh, as we look at the uh, as we look at the move to the Q and A. All right, so here's our latest map. So uh, this map does a couple of things. It gives you uh, the size of each state relative to its uh, electoral heft. What matters? We're starting, you'll start to hear scenarios in the media, talking to lots of reporters these days, uh, on background, not always for attribution. And what you're finding is that, is this going to be a repeat of 2000, but the sides will be reversed? In other words, does President Obama win the electoral vote, but does, Mitt, does Governor Romney win the popular vote? Very interesting scenario. So we put together these types of things, these maps, that show us a probability of what's happening. And a close race, this is something to take away from today, in a close race, Florida goes red. In a close race, Florida goes red. That is one key assumption that our model has. That's one key assumption. So this is why I mentioned the Medicare at the beginning, why I mentioned the presidential debate. In a key state, Florida probably goes red. Florida has 29 electoral votes. If Governor Romney wins Florida and it's 29 electoral votes, he has a path to 270. It's not, you'll hear about Ohio, you'll hear about Virginia, and Wisconsin, and Iowa, and Nevada, and Colorado, and so forth. But Florida becomes a key linchpin. And of the battleground states, the three key states are Ohio, Virginia, and Florida. Ohio, Virginia, and Florida. So we can concentrate on those states to see what's going to happen. I'm going to show you lots of maps. I'm going to show you some changes. Uh, I go to Carl Rove's website every day because what Rove does, uh, some of you know who've had me in class, is he puts up maps and he puts up talking points, and then he takes them off. And he does that to drive the narrative of what's happening by reporters who work for Fox and for MSNBC. He dry, tries to drive the, narr drive the narrative and puts up lots of different maps at different times. And I'll show you some of those based upon some screen captures. All right, so as you can see from this map, what we have is Obama having 207 electoral votes, a slightly higher base than Governor Romney slightly higher base than Governor Romney. We have Nevada going slightly blue, tilting. Nevada is very interesting because it has the second largest Mormon population in the United States. Governor Romney never left that state when he, when he uh, didn't, uh, wasn't successful in 2008. He never left. But Democrats have a huge ground operation there. The Obama team has spent a lot of money there, and they have the secret weapon on their side, and that's uh, obviously former President Bill Clinton, who spends a lot of time in Nevada. So Nevada, we have a slightly, uh, slightly leaning Democratic. Colorado, we have is pink. Colorado is certainly up in the air in this regard, uh, and it has several divisive ballot measures on the ballot that probably draw out more Democratic-leaning voters than Republican-leaning voters, but Republicans are much more enthusiastic in that state. So while we pay attention to national polls and what's happening, I'll show you some of these national polls. What you want to pay attention to is what's happening on a sub-national basis what's happening in swing states, state by state. So let's do two things. One, let's pay attention to what's happening in key battleground states. States like Florida, states like Virginia, Ohio, Colorado, Wisconsin, and so forth. And let's pay attention to the differences in preferences between registered voter polls and likely voter polls. Very important. The Gallup likely voter poll, the last Gallup likely voter poll that occurs right before the election is one of the best indicators of what will happen on the Tuesday of the general election. It's been hugely robust and hugely successful as an indicator of direction. Registered voters are much more democratic as an electorate, as a sample size, than likely voters. Likely voters, you get more of those swing voters. And in political science, we don't think swing voters exist. We don't believe people who say that they're independent and swing voters. We just don't believe them. So when we, what we do is we start asking them questions about God, guns, gays and lesbians, and abortion. And once we start doing that, what we find out is they lean blue or red. And the swath that's actually truly undecided in the middle is quite small. And if you're in professional politics, you know this. And that number is between 35,000 and 40,000 people in the United States. <laughs> they elect the President of the United States, and they're the truly purple people. So you got purple people in a swath, right? And they live outside of Tampa, and outside of Las Vegas, and outside of Denver, and outside of Columbus, and, uh, and outside the Beltway in, in, in Virginia. And they're purple, 
but we start asking them questions and we start deciphering the purple people and moving closer and closer together and we find somewhere around 37 or 38,000 purple people. Truly purple swingers. The swing voters that right at the end of the election will cast a ballot and make a decision. And the power of these people vis-a-vis -vis your individual vote, and we've, we've quantified this, is eight, nine times, 12 times what your individual power of the vote is. So when people say their vote doesn't matter, it certainly does. You just have to look and live in the right place to have your vote truly matter. And your vote can matter 10 times, 12 times what someone in the room has. Okay. So uh, this week, let's take a look at some events this week that are going to drive the narrative. The president will be on the Daily Show on Thursday uh, with John Stewart. It's his sixth appearance, his second appearance as president, and the last time he appeared was in October 2010. Now, I would uh, chide the Obama administration because they didn't pay attention to the midterm election in 2010 until about October 1st, 2010. And he appeared October 5th, 6th, 2010, when it was clear Republicans were going to do very well in the midterm election. It was very clear. So this appearance is critical for this election, but it may be too little too late at some level. We're, at this point, we're going to be about, we're going to be less than three weeks out when he makes this appearance. It's a very interesting strategy, and one that I would argue uh, is late at some level. We have the debate on Tuesday. During that day, Bruce Springsteen, Springsteen the boss, and Bill Clinton will be campaigning in Ohio. Springsteen hasn't come out yet, but they're going to be out rocking the vote uh, and drawing people out uh, on, on Tuesday to uh, kind of develop the narrative and, and to build the momentum for the president to maybe give him a boost so he doesn't have the debate debacle that he had uh, a, a, in the first debate. The last debate will be in Florida with Bob Schieffer, who's already indicated to the campaigns the foreign policy questions he's going to ask broadly. What questions? So this should be a very interesting debate because that debate will be held again on the 22nd of October. For the last few weeks of this election, the driving dominant narrative, the themes of the narrative, if you want to think of it in terms of, a, of an English class or something like that, is going, the themes are going to revolve around change versus trust. Change versus trust. And these are the dominant lines and ways of thinking that came out of the vice presidential debate. What worked for the vice president vis-a-vis -vis Representative Ryan and what didn't work. They were testing all of this in the Insta polls overnight and in their focus groups. And what the campaigns have found is that dominant narratives of change versus trust will drive the last few weeks. And obviously, uh, what's happening with gas prices affects the ability of Democrats to pick up seats in the House. And this is not only California-centric, but largely California-centric. Democrats were hoping to pick up five to seven seats, House seats, in California alone. And they'll be lucky to get three. So this is a huge, huge development. And as gas prices surge and continue with a collapsing time frame of, of less than a couple of weeks, it's going to be very difficult uh, for Democrats to get to that drive for 25. All right. So what we have going on so far is economic conditions driving, at least from our standpoint as scholars, driving the debate. So we pay attention to unemployment. We pay attention to what's happening uh, in terms of uh, the markets and how things are moving. When is the last unemployment jobs report prior to the election? It's on the Friday before the Tuesday election. It's on Friday right before the Tuesday election. Is the last, excuse me, jobs report, the last national jobs report. Now that doesn't seem to have played a big deal when jobs were lost in the September report in terms of affecting the president's popularity. And the president doesn't seem to have gotten richly rewarded from the 7.8 number. Uh, don't forget, it's the Chicago conspiracy if you get the Jack Welch Twitters. Right? The 7.8% number didn't move the needle very much for the president in the last report. So it's unclear the degree to which there is a payoff for any positive jobs report the Friday before the Tuesday of the election. But if that number is in the wrong direction, if it's going back up, it, there will be a substantial penalty for the incumbent. So it's a very interesting kind of play and dynamic that could affect those last purple people eater voters right at the end. Okay? Uh, there are 70, again, we, we don't have a lot of rules here in the sense that we don't have a lot of data. We have 16 observations. There is typically a second term closeness effect that let's say the president wins. Our model 5148 currently, it was 5149 earlier in the year. 
The president wins re-election, 51-48, somewhere around there. It portends huge problems in 2014. Huge problems. Historically, the president's biggest loss, or the incumbent's biggest loss, is their second midterm, 2014. And it sets up a mammoth battle for 2016 in terms of what's happening. So this election, coming up in 23 days, is as, as much about 2016 and 2014 as it is 2012. It's important thing to keep in mind. All right. So we have a numbers game at this point. This is what we have. The race is settled into a numbers game and turning out the voters. And we know in Ohio, early voting is quite high. Early voting is about a fifth of all voters have already voted in Ohio, about one fifth. The Obama team has a number of offices in Ohio. They've registered huge numbers of voters in Ohio. So this is one reason we have Ohio kind of trending blue. In Iowa, the Obama team has three times, as, almost three times as many offices as Romney does. So we have Iowa kind of trending blue uh, because of this get out the vote effort and what's happening. But we've seen some very interesting developments. If you've paid attention to what's happening from basically Morocco to the Straits of Hormuz, there's been a whole host of developments. We are now 32 days from, uh, from the events that happened at Benghazi and the slaying of four Americans, including the U.S. ambassador, and there's been no U.S. response. But there's been a mammoth amount of buildup of troops over these 32 days, including operations with the French in northern Mali, including operations around Libya, including paying attention very closely to what's been happening with the Syrian-Turkey uh, uh, border, in terms of what's been building up in Spain, in terms of what's been building up in Greece. There's been a mammoth amount of troop buildup and movement since about September 24. This is as much about affecting Iranian perceptions of what's happening as it is about drawing down troops who are being pulled out of Afghanistan and aren't being sent back right away. They're being repositioned throughout that period. Or, I'm sorry, without that, throughout that geographic area what often by U.S. policymakers is called the arc of instability. And that arc of instability is seeing a huge number, a huge number, an increase in U.S. presence and act activity by our armed forces. We'll look at the changes in the polls. We'll look at registration and turnout as variables because the registration uh, deadlines are kind of collapsing. And uh, we'll also look at this in terms of media buys as well. I'm going to show you some Nielsen data on uh, how the campaigns are buying time, and I encourage all of my students and all of you who've uh, been with me know this, you should look at what's called CMAG data, C-M-A-G, C-M-A-G. This is Campaign Media Analysis Group, and they present data on media buys in key states and all states for what the campaigns are doing. And it gives us a huge number in terms of what people are doing in the campaigns and how they're communicating and with uh, which voters they're communicating. All right. So here's, here's, here's the stats. We have Romney has big mo. Okay, he has the momentum currently headed into the second debate. But the race seems to have stabilized to about where we were pre-convention. So those numbers are about where they were before. And the bumps has, have essentially ended in this race. The bumps are over. So we shouldn't see big swings. We should see a settling in of bias by voters is what we would, how we would refer to it. So if Romney is slightly ahead, in certain sub-state likely voter polls, that should settle in with the time period collapsing. It makes the president's debate performance hugely disappointing if you wanted him to win re-election, and if you're the Romney campaign, you captured a momentum that you just have to ride for a little bit. <clears throat> Obama has fewer likely states as wins as a result of this, but he has a higher electoral vote base. He has more EVs, and, and frankly, you win the presidency by getting to 270. That's the only thing that matters, is getting to 270 electoral votes. Romney, though, has a clear path with Florida and with Virginia. But Obama has more avenues to 270. So this makes uh, states like Colorado, perhaps not even Ohio as much, because there's been some interesting things happening in the Midwest and the upper Midwest. That used to be red territory, Republican territory, and they're essentially ceding that territory. Maybe not Wisconsin, because of Paul Ryan, but they are essentially saying goodbye to Pennsylvania, goodbye to Ohio, goodbye to Michigan. They'll maintain Indiana. They're not going to have Illinois. They may not be competitive in Wisconsin, slightly blue-ish. And they're probably not going to have Iowa. Republicans are ceding that territory to go in other directions, which give them some paths to 270 that weren't there before. So let's look at some data. <clears throat> Here is the 
free debate, September 9th, median electoral vote estimate with a 95% confidence interval. This is how many electoral votes President Obama will get. This is done by Sam Yang at Princeton, election.princeton.edu. I'll show you this, I'll walk you through it. And it shows President Obama with above 300 electoral votes. Anyone remember how many he got in 2008? 365. 365. Okay. Here's the post-debate. Median EV estimate with a 95 and 99% confidence interval. <coughs> what do you notice about the red line? <laughs> uh, yeah, it does. It, 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 you see a gigantic fall after the debate. And this is, again, aggregating many polls. Some of you go to real clear politics, these types of things. So this is a momentum indicator, but also the level of error that, that what we're going to miss by in this model gets much wider. It gets much wider. Indeed, it falls below the 270 line as potential that we could be wrong in terms of this estimate. Does the Biden-Ryan Biden, uh, debate really has it have The question uh, was, does the Biden-Ryan debate have much of an effect? Uh, we haven't seen that yet. It takes a little bit of a lag, Doc, to, to, to have that come out. And vice presidential debates generally move the, the <coughs> polls in the momentum direction they were going, generally. So if Romney was surging a little bit, he should surge and hold. Now, it's not unusual that Romney did so well in terms of polling, because uh, you could ask President Kerry, you could ask President Gore, you could ask President Mondale, President Dole, who all did very well in that first debate, what actually happens during the election. And so it's not unusual that they cut it. Not, not at all. Uh, here's the median EV. All right, this is the median EV, the latest one. Or, I'm sorry, this is 18th September, sorry. Let me come back. This is 18th September, showing you kind of what was happening right prior to that debate and then the fall off. Okay, which was back here. <clears throat> you can see the follow -ups. Okay, so what this, where do we get that from? Is what some of you should ask. And this is a difference in the Romney Obama popular vote. A difference of two percentage points, four percentage points, or six percentage points, five percentage points. So what does a popular vote difference translate into in terms of electoral vote? So if there's a difference in popular vote, how does that translate? And as you can see, this number is moving closer and closer closer and closer to basically uh, where a two-point difference, sorry, get this down, a two-point difference can settle into an electoral vote that's quite, quite close. The model that we have and we ran this morning shows uh, President Obama with 277 electoral votes, which is enough. But prior to the debate, he had, uh, I believe, 285 or 290, something like that. I'll show you this here in a second. So there's a precipitous, it, what it leaves is no margin for error. You lose one state, and if it's a relatively sizable state, it's a double-digit state, you get close, but you don't get the presidency. So the debate had a huge impact. All right? Here's what's happened in terms of popular vote, as, per, as referred by this is registered and likely voters, combining both polls, this is what's happened in terms of that precipitous kind of closeness and fall off. <clears throat> okay? So uh, let's, let's look at the closeness for the battlegrounds. All right, and, and this is the kind of give you some idea of where we're coming from. North Carolina was the state that the president won uh, in 2008, and it was close, the closest state. As you can see, he won by three tenths of a percentage point in 2008. He won 49.7 to 49.4. This is one reason they held the convention there. That state should go red. This election, it should go red. Ohio, four points, 51.47. But look at Florida. 51.48, 51.48. And if you look at Nevada, you see a 12-point margin. So Nevada may not be as much of a battleground as we might think. It made some sense from, for Governor Romney to stay there, but that 12-point that gap from 2008 tells us something about the polls in Nevada underestimating Democratic turnout and under, underestimating the Democratic vote. So Florida, maybe Virginia, North Carolina are key battleground areas. And if you think, if you're the Romney folks and you think you're going to do well in North Carolina, you move all your assets to Florida. Florida becomes that battleground. Here's the June-July prediction. 
Some of you have been to talks I give throughout the year, and this is a map we had earlier, which showed uh, the president with 247 electoral votes. Governor Romney, at that time not the formal nominee, but the Republican nominee with 206, again a higher base, and that base has essentially come down. Here's the last week of August, the race changing. A little bit, not much, but changing a little. Here's the final vote in 2008. The final vote in terms of where states went. Just to give you some idea. Essentially, uh, with the exception of Missouri, President Obama ran the table. He won every state that was a swing state or he needed to win. He won every one. They were golden in 2008, which makes uh, the debacle of the debate so much more interesting. They seem to be playing from behind. They seem to be better at playing from the behind, but they seem to have changed their strategy a little bit. You can also go to in-trade and bet on this. I do. A couple of colleagues do. We put our money where our mouth is, and we actually you can actually place bets. And in-trade, the in-trade markets and the Iowa electronic markets, IEM, you can actually place bets like you would in the Irish sweepstakes about what's going to happen and what the general direction is. And the trend directions in in-trade, the Irish sweepstakes, and IEM are actually quite indicative of what's happening. So it's very interesting. It, it does reward momentum and those price puts, but you can essentially bet on it. All right. So do debates matter? Yes, absolutely. They absolutely do. Because here is the pre and post debate numbers from Gallup. <clears throat> pre debate, Obama had a five point lead. Cut that in half, and essentially you're even. Which would be historically the norm for the first presidential debate. Not unusual. But it seems that the Obama team hasn't been able to recover from that momentum. And it may have actually grown a little bit in key states like Florida. Here's the bump solidifying, essentially, into a difference where the president is slightly ahead on registered voters. He does better in registered voter polls than likely voter polls. He does better in registered voters than likely voter polls. We have more Democrats and more women in the registered voter pool. He does better with those groups. And essentially, it locks into some, some dead even. <clears throat> this is about the bump. I don't want to walk you through this. Here's the one. Presidential preferences by likely and registered voters. Likely voters on top, registered voters on the bottom, just to show you the difference. So if you look at this, it shows us earlier, and notice that this is a seven-day moving average, which is better than a three-day moving mm -hmm. average. A three-day moving average has much higher margin of error. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a momentum indicator. A seven-day moving average is much better. So you want seven-day moving averages, and you want to compare likely and registered voters. And when you do that, what you see is likely voters are 47% to Mitt Romney 49%. And this number has gone down. This is uh, the not, not sure, undecided number. Notice that it was 5% for registered voters. That's generally what we think today. It's a 5% swing vote that's undecided. And generally, that undecided swing vote goes more to the challenger than to the incumbent until you get to the end of the election. When you're within seven days, it breaks more evenly than it does to the challenger as opposed to the incumbent. So if you're Mitt Romney, the debate on Tuesday night is very important for you as well in terms of drawing out all of those voters and locking in those undecideds because you're going to get more bang for the buck. As you get closer to the election, you get a return on those, but not at the same rate. <clears throat> all right. This is where everything began to change. This is a screen grab from the PewTrust.org, plural, PewTrust.org. This is the Pew poll that came out on Monday night, the uh, last Monday night, the first national poll that showed the race shifting, that wasn't run by MSNBC or Fox, the first reliable poll. <laughs> now, there's some problems with this poll. It's run by Andy Coat, who's an excellent pollster, but he does massage a little bit the likely voter pool. He does massage that a little bit. But it's the first national respected poll that showed a shift in the race because of the debate. It has registered and likely voters shows uh, Mitt Romney gaining strength from middle September to early October. Same with likely voters. President Obama shedding some of that, and the undecided number going down. <clears throat> if we look at, in the bold, it might be easier to see this in the back, 
uh, if you can see the numbers, the, the bold numbers give us statistically significant advantages Republican and uh, for the Republican and for the uh, president. So what you see is, if you look at traits by swing voters, we just asked swing voters, which candidate is a strong leader? Obama leads, takes more moderate positions, the president, honest and truthful, the president, consistent, the president, connects well with ordinary Americans, plus 62 is the difference. There's your talking points if you're the president. Who would do a better job reducing the federal budget deficit? Plus 21, the challenger. There's the Romney Ryan talking point. Right there, reduce the deficit. Improve the job situation, they have a 13 point advantage. So Pew's poll gave us very important insight in terms of how the race and the demographics were shifting. Okay? Who's gonna help the middle class? Look at this, more now see Romney helping the middle class after the debate than before the debate. Very interesting shift. This is this is this is a Titanic shift. <laughs> Monumental. Okay. He picked up Mitt Romney's policies would help middle class people. He picked up eight points. Eight points. That's huge. Would help poor people plus six percent. Okay. It's a huge development. And the bonus is that his favorability rating after went above the president's. And the president's favorability and likability, as you may recall, was going to be the key to their debate success. Whoops. <laughs> Studying silence. Sorry, just showing you the data. <laughs> All right. So here's what it looks like. Here's the, the, here's the update, 10, 11, 12. GOP only polls have a Romney up by four points. If you just look at Florida. Florida, he's up by four. That's just GOP only polls. Just using GOP operations. They have a vested interest in this. But just to show you, some of the momentum in Florida is, is shifting a little bit. <clears throat> what's changed? Florida and Virginia. That's basically what's happened. Florida and Virginia. <clears throat> and uh, I'll, I'm going to stop it here and we'll, get, we'll take questions in just a second. Here's the shift. Here's the model. The president had an 86% chance of winning the election prior to the debate. After the debate, using some of this data, he went from 86% to 68% after the debate. His chance of winning. Now, that's a good place to be, but recall that presidents win re-election 70% of the time. He's at 68%. He's lagging, essentially, the data that we have. He's lagging behind and losing the momentum at some level. This says nothing about the House. This says nothing about the Senate and how that's changing. But the race is slipping away from them. And this is where I'd make some criticisms of the president. He has no one to blame for his debate performance but himself. His staff would not have prepared him that way. He has no one to blame but himself. And he has to capture that back. Somehow, if they have any chance, because this race could shift dramatically and carry some momentum. And that could drag and lead to other changes, for example, in the U.S. Senate and in the U.S. House growing. It's a very interesting shift that's going on right now. now I'm going to be very clear. It's very fluid. It's closing and tightening. We expected this. But the president seems to be losing a momentum that at least historically, institutionally, he had. And it's very, so, okay. Here's the, let me show you the Karl Rove and then we'll, 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 we'll go to questions. Here's Rove's uh, model. This is uh, eight, end of April. End of April 2012, earlier this year. Okay. Even Texas, he only had a leaning Romney. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Arizona, right? South Dakota, leaning Romney, five day points. Here's the Electoral College trend that he, let, he put up through October 8th to give you some idea of the trend and what's happening. Showing you the difference between leaning Obama, solid Obama, leaning Romney and, 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 and solid Romney. To give you some idea of the president starting with a higher base. As you can see, starting with a higher base, as guaranteed, but also the trends are going in different directions. And here's his map. The last map he has up on his website, which shows some of these changes. And, and the argument here, hold on just one second. The argument here would be that Florida is trending red, North Carolina is red, Iowa is probably blue, and Colorado may be up for grabs. But it's an interesting map because you can see some of the psyche of what he's playing with and the variables that he's looking at. Yeah, let's, yes, sir. And I'll, let's go to your questions. I'll, I'll put up some different maps if you want, but let's go to your questions. I, I think she's going to give you uh, the mic. Mm 
you mentioned briefly the gamblers. And there is no pollster that has a better record than the gamblers do. And I'll give you the numbers from one hour ago. The Iowa electronic markets have Obama 61.39. That's the odds. In trade, uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of winning, of winning, yeah, yeah, yeah. winner win win take off, yeah, yeah that has nothing off. to do with with, yeah. with votes. Yeah, let's go back to this. Right. There you go. Okay. <laughs> in trade, Obama sixty one thirty nine, and then there's a third one called the Las Vegas presidential odds that I go to. Yeah. And they they state their figures a little differently. You have to put up hundred and ninety dollars to win a hundred on Obama. Obama. That's how big a favorite he is. Yeah. And so. Those who are saying, dead heat, dead heat, dead heat, I would remind them that they said that with Kerry against Bush eight years ago, and the gamblers never budged. The gamblers said, Bush is going to win, and he won. So if you want to say dead heat and go to Las Vegas, they'll be happy to take your money. <laughs> uh, let me give you a short response. One is, the way those markets work, is they are forward indicating indicators, they are forward leaning indicators of uh, rewarding momentum. So what should happen to the positions is if the president has a strong debate performance, just as an example, they'll reward that momentum and it will stabilize. It might go it might not go as high as this, but it would go back. So they're somewhat forward leaning leading indicators. And most of the polling data that we have, most people aren't going to IEM and to these places. Most people are paying attention to the polls. So as the polls stabilize over, say, that three to seven day period, they'll use those as markers. But the leading indicators of IEM and of Intrade have already shifted and grabbed that momentum instantaneously. If you go back and look at when Hillary Clinton's odds changed during the 2008 battle with President Obama, Senator Obama at the time, what you would see is in the IEM and Intrade, they changed very late. They recognize that change quite late. So they're, while they're forward leading, they're not always the best indicator because they're kind of rewarding a bit of this, of this momentum. Please. On election day morning, what percentage of likely voters will, be, will have already voted? Um, that's a great question. Well, we, it's going to be probably around 40%. Maybe a little bit higher, maybe as much as 45%. It won't quite be 50%, but, but there's, great, there's great variance in that. Uh, let me make this clear. There's, there's a lot of variance because everybody votes VBM, absentee up here uh, in, in this area, but you don't see that consistently across the country. But the likely voter number should be around 40%. It could hit 45, but we don't see indications of that yet. We don't see indications. And then you want to cut it by party because enthusiasm for... Republican voters is much greater than Democratic voters, at least so far. And then young people, you want to cut it by several different things. So there's several different kind of cross tabs you would want to run on that. Good question. All right, Doc. Thank you, Dave, for yes. another great lecture. Sure. Uh, I'm going to change the direction completely. Uh, where are we going? <laughs> I'm going to ask you, or ask the audience perhaps, does anyone even know the name? of the uh, woman that's running against Diane Feinstein. I, I happen to know her name, sure, but uh, mainly because there's a poster on my street. But <laughs> other than that, I didn't even thought about it. All right, so the question was about Elizabeth Emkin, who's running against um, Senator Feinstein. Uh, we tried um, to move a debate on that race to the GMC. Um, so that we could build some non-music related but important thing. We've been trying to build the vice presidential and the presidential debates going forward into the GMC, which you would know, everyone here, in the, if we had pulled that off, we would, we would you know, everyone would know Elizabeth Enkin's name. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's the one safe prediction I'll make, she's gonna lose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did see a few signs coming in, actually. Very interesting. Um, the first presidential debate, it was very obvious that Obama looked terrible. Uh, he looked old and tired. Should I write some notes while you're saying that? <laughs> and uh, I wonder 
especially about the racial issue uh, and swing voters. Are you able to address that in any way? There is a bias, uh, and, but that bias has been consistent, especially amongst white working class voters. So if the president has a gender gap in his favor, women uh, favor him at higher rates than men, and then we look at ethnicity by income. White working class voters favor Governor Romney by between 40 and 50 points. It's huge. It's huge. Now the president has Hispanic Latino support that's larger than that. He had the magic number of 70% support by Pew uh, a week or so ago. In that white working class support, there's a huge contingent of that that don't like the president because of his ethnicity. There's no doubt about that, but it's been consistent. And if my numbers serve me right, I'm trying. The president grabbed 40, 40, 41, 42 percent of the white working class male vote in 2008. The number they want to hit this election is 37 percent. 37 percent, and that number may be too high. So one thing I would argue is that. <coughs> If they don't hit the 37% number, and younger voters don't turn out because they're not as enthusiastic, and Latinos aren't as enthusiastic and don't vote, the loss will not be as much about Latino voters and about the young people as it is not getting to that very low number of 37% white working class because of his, because of race. And there's just no way around it. What we don't have, where I thought you were going with your question, we don't have good data in general elections about religious bigotry and the Mormon question. We just don't have good data about that. We do in, in primaries, but we don't have good data about it. And, and quite frankly, in dealing with the press, nobody wants to discuss that for, for obvious reasons. So, so there are other things working on the other side, but, but the level of them and how important they are, we don't have good data about that. It's a great question. Thank you. Please. Hello, sir. My question is kind of spooky, and I hope you forgive me. Okay, speak up just a little bit. I'll repeat the question. But. My question is whether or not you think possible that uh, President Obama may have experienced a kind of Johnson moment, namely that he see a situation so dire for next year that would consider suicidal for himself and for the party to become president again. I think the elections of 2008 have clearly demonstrated that, 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 that uh, uh, getting power at such critical moments in the economy of the nation, unemployment and so forth, is something very unforgiving. If you want to wish suicide to a party, I would say win this January. Thank you. I, I think they want to win. I, I think, I think uh, the, the question was whether or not the president uh, would, be, would be committing suicide. If you won, whoever wins in January, or whoever wins in November, takes office in January, are they committing suicide for their party, using the president as an example? Would the president be committing suicide for the Democratic Party if they won re-election because of the dire set of circumstances moving forward into next year? Uh, if you follow that, the House stays Republican, and the Senate is close, but favoring Democrats. And if the president won re-election, it would be very difficult to get much done next year. They probably could get immigration reform done. Uh, they'll have to deal with the fiscal cliff issue and the federal debt issue. But how well they do that, or whether they just do it for a year or two, and does all of this lead to some situation where they win, but they're left with the spoils of governing, and it's too difficult, and essentially creates some type of party suicide. And, and I, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't support that point of view at all, in the sense that they want to win, they think they can make a difference, and the, more dramatically, the party coalitions are shifting. The Democratic Party faces this later than the Republican Party. The Democratic Party is hemorrhaging labor support because there aren't as many folks in the labor movement. It's important, but it changes the Democratic coalition. But like 2016, 2018, 2020, the Republican coalition is, much, is hemorrhaging and changing much earlier because it's concentrated in the South, it's whiter, uh, it's older, and as a result, that demographic is changing, and Republicans are gonna face this a little bit earlier than Democrats, but both party coalitions are changing, which means it's gonna be hard for 
moving forward for actually governing whatever that's going to look like, that new political universe and that new matchup of parties, because you're going to have a lot more people detaching from party. You're going to have a lot more people who are purple, even though we don't believe they're purple. And that'll make governing more challenging than committing party suicide. Please. You, uh, you said that political scientists go by money rather than... The pocketbook. Yeah, go by the pocketbook. Mm -hmm. Would you illustrate what you mean by that? Sure. Using Carly Fiorina and Meg Whitman and pg and &E in, in the last election, as opposed to the gazillions of dollars that are being spent in this election. Yeah, uh, so if we look at... Uh, first, then there's a couple of things in the, in the comment, or in the question. Uh, <laughs> when we're not sure that money buys great success in elections, uh, we would point to someone like the gazillionaire, Meg Whitman, and say that, in general, the very rich who spend money on their campaigns make one of the worst business decisions of their lives doing that. And there's a lot of electoral history to demonstrate this, because money produces diminishing marginal return, and there may be some backlash effect. <coughs> So money doesn't always buy you success, but where money does buy you success is on the no side of ballot measures, against things, or in blocking things. So money is, a, is an important indicator of protecting the status quo. And then I want to uh, disentangle that from actual like economic measures of the election. If we look at economic measures of the election, sorry, there's the Twitter universe. <laughs> what we get are lots of models like this that look at the pocketbook as indicators. I'm going to back up from this. This is the model that I use all the time, the Time for Change model, which looks at GDP growth and net approval of the president. It has nothing to do about campaigns. It is just about Gallup approval and whether there's GDP growth in the second quarter. And this shows the president basically with net approval that's zero or slightly positive, with GDP growth that's around the same as in that 4851 kind of range. And notice this is absent debate performances, this is absent all the millions of dollars of spending and all these kinds of things, because we think those elements balance out. And that's because voters have a lot of information about the presidential race. They don't have as much information about Elizabeth Emkin or about other races. And that's where campaign spending can be important, and it can have an effect. But at the presidential level, there's so much going on that voters, especially the purple people, have lots of cues to look for. Please. Um. The, a couple of pundits on the radio were saying that if Jim Lehrer had kept better control of the debate and played by the rules, the results would have been vastly different. What is your comment? I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that because the president uh, had an opportunity to perform and to step on the guy's neck, and he didn't do that because they wanted to maintain their likability and favorability numbers, yes. supposedly. Um, and the president, uh, so I, I, I read the debates twice, I listen to them twice, and I watch them twice. This is a lot of work. <laughs> there are eight specific instances on point where the president could have pivoted directly to the auto bailouts and or Detroit or GM or said something, and never did. Eight instances. And he never did that. This is not 47%, this, you know, Medicare, and other, he could have directly made contrast or distinction with his opponent, and he didn't do it. And I think that's fundamentally because he wasn't on his game. And that's why I think fundamentally you can't blame the moderator. Don't forget, Democrats also want to blame uh, voter fraud in Pennsylvania. They're going to win that state, it's going to be blue. Voter fraud can, and voter suppression can affect down-ballot house races. That's one race in, in, in Pennsylvania, it's, it's Congressional District 12. But Karl Rove has spent $5 million in that district. <laughs> so what's more important, the $5 million in a McCain-winning district in 2008 represented by a Democrat or voter suppression and blaming the moderator? At some point, you've got to deliver your voters to the polls, you've got to do what you're supposed to do, and you can't blame other things. That's my, my fundamental problem with that kind of analysis. Please. Uh, sorry. Uh, hold, hold on one second. I'm curious about what you said about uh, Mormonism yes. uh, not being addressed because Kennedy had a speak about being Catholic in 1960. Mm -hmm. Obama had a speak about his ethnicity yeah. four years ago. Uh, as recently as the vice presidential debate, both candidates were asked about their religion. So why uh, does Romney 
uh, not have to address this issue. Uh, it, there seems to be a, a reluctance by elite media to discuss whether or not Romney's political, I'm sorry, his religious beliefs matter to voters. No one seems to want to bring that up. They think it's too volatile. We also don't have good survey data on it because people lie. They lie about they lie about being racist. They lie about being misogynist. I mean, pick your. They lie a lot. We this is you know we can't ask people if they're evangelical. We have to ask them how often they go to church, and whether or not they consider the Bible to be the word of God, to get us at indirectly their religiosity. So there are a lot of things that the media in their direct questioning and trying to visit this issue has to get at indirectly because they think they won't get honest answers. Also, no one wants to be the... It's funny that the media is always about scoops and kind of running and getting the, the first thing, but nobody wants to touch this particular issue. And it may not matter for those purple people at a large level. It might matter for uh, bluer voters who aren't going to vote red anyways. So uh, that, that's one reason it's not visited. Question. Yeah. Yeah. Would you tell the story about uh, when you monitored early voters? Not your mom's story. Uh, yeah. Okay. So there's a. This is a question about delivering. Uh, delivering votes and, and early voters. So what has happened? What one technique that's been used in the past? How about that? One technique that's been used in the past is uh, to deliver early voters in California and voters on election day. Is you uh, go to the you go to voters who are high propensity voters, like the demographic in the room, like uh, older women, and you bring them flowers, mugs, white mugs. You deliver flowers to them, and around the pot, you happen to have uh, vote for X, whatever candidate that is. And you offer to take, you deliver the flowers to them, and that was the last time they got flowers. Like their husband was alive or something, you know. You, and then you deliver them to the polls. And in the process of delivering them to the polls, we believe that you carry a huge percentage of that vote, 80% of that vote, by delivering the flowers, driving them to the polls so they can vote. You don't urge them for whom to vote. What you do is you tell them, remember who gave you the flowers. <laughs> and you deliver better than 80% of that vote because they come back into the car and they tell you exactly who they voted for. <laughs> Yes. Do you have an opinion on Nate Silver at 538.com? Yes. I do. Uh, I, his, his model and some of his numbers are in here. Uh, and uh, I read that blog religiously. Uh, I have a great gift from a student to have dinner with Nate after the election, where we're going to compare his model and my model. Uh, and I have a friend of mine. Are there? Yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many friends I have all of a sudden. I have a, I have a close friend who's a pollster who works, does some work for the San Francisco Giants, uh, and he, we want to pick Nate's brain about fantasy baseball so we can make some money off of this. <laughs> not, about, not about this, but uh, we, we will do this after the election because we're both a little bit busy. Uh, but I do follow his blog, I do build in the model. Uh, it, it's wonderful, let me just say. I think it's leading and wonderful uh, and highly accurate. If you look at some of those numbers, like the 68% to 67.9, uh, our, our model predicts Currently, that the president, I'm going to say, gets 277 electoral votes, and I think Nate's model is a little bit higher than that. So, I tend to be very conservative in my numbers, and he tends to be a little bit looser. And I want to have some conversations about that. So, thank you for asking that. Please, I have another well done job. Thank you. Um, the one point that you made about change versus trust. Yeah, that's the dominant themes for the last okay. three. So weeks. you're telling us that Romney's slogan is now change, and, and the bomb is his trust. Change and hope, maybe. No, no, uh, we'll go but change was yeah. in that. Okay. Yeah, so, so they'll, they'll go change. So they'll talk about, you know, uh, to place that in context, they'll talk about uh, the lack of economic growth, what's happened to household income the last four years. That would be an example of what they would do, how they would, how would they, they reinforce that theme. All right, in regards to going back to the debate, yes, Obama was tired. I think he has a lot on his plate. The Middle East is kind of warm and hot. Um, I believe, and I'm a firm believer of this from day one, he sits back and lets, o lets Romney speak to show us who he is. You must believe when you see it. 
And to that point, I just finished reading Tim Dickinson's uh, new article in Rolling Stone. Excellent. I highly recommend it. Excellent. It's a great article. I, have read. Ah. Uh, I think that what their, their plan in the debate performance was to paint Romney into a corner on several specific issues to visit that narrative over five of the right. next five weeks. Right. And I fundamentally think that's a strategy that's risky mm -hmm. because yes, you should prepare and know what you're going to do and not have to spend five weeks redefining the race. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's a strategy that runs, and I've been very consistent in, in panels and discussions about this, it's a strategy that carries a higher error rate and you work without a net. You shouldn't have to spend five weeks doing that. And that's, mm -hmm. that's where I think you've seen the bump in the settling in. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I just heard this morning that massive amounts of white flowers were delivered to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Right out of uh, page 101 of the campaign manual. There were none left for Oakmont retirees. <laughs> but I, I seriously would like to find out whether Oakmont retirees would be more rational than Florida retirees. Because Florida, with its large population of retirees, seems to behave extraordinarily irrational in my book because if, if I were in Florida and retired, I would seriously be concerned about the changes which the Republicans might make. In fact, they're saying they're going to make. And like yet you are that. saying, and yet sure. you are saying that Florida will be the key state, which might Florida, be. Florida, Virginia, Florida, Virginia. So what's what's your uh, the the vice president in the vice presidential debate tried to test several lines related to this. Talking about the Medicare voucher as a Groupon voucher. A Groupon equivalent. Everyone, does everyone know in the room what Groupon is? Okay, this is part, this is part of my demonstration. How, how many of you do know what Groupon is? Okay, so, so uh, maybe 40% of the room doesn't. So you have to educate voters about what Groupon is, right? You, you get this voucher and then you purchase pay this price and you get all these extra things. There has to be some education about this. This is part of the kind of five-week plan at some level. But if they can paint Medicare as a voucher that's similar to Groupon, that might be a winning strategy for them. But I don't know that that's their strategy as much as it is drawing out more Hispanic voters and younger voters in Florida, while at the same time talking about these things that could shift with Medicare. So how quickly the president mentions Medicare in a foreign policy debate will be an interesting indicator of this. They're going to talk about foreign policy. They're going to be town hall related. He's got to work in Medicare or speak to voters in Florida and speak to voters in Northern Virginia. And I think that's a challenge moving forward, which is why the first presidential debate was so difficult for them. Uh, in terms of how they handled it. In the last debate at Lynn University on the 22nd of October, that's all foreign policy. So how they pivot back. They didn't pivot well in the first debate. How does the president pivot? His last chance, I would argue, to pivot is Tuesday night. That's how big I think this is. Because people are voting, they have their ballots, all these things are happening. And so he has to pivot and educate at the same time about the Groupon voucher uh, parallel. And that's a difficult thing to do in the last several weeks. I, uh, and, 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 I'm sorry, I, I think they should be able to beat the guy. And they're, they're, they wanted this guy, this is the guy they wanted for a year, and they seem ill-prepared to think of move on their feet. And they did very well in 2008, so I, I'm not sure exactly what's gone wrong. I like to talk about the uh, California election proposition yeah. uh, 30. Sure. That, uh, I'm going to pull up a uh, pull up. A it's pretty point. important, and yet I have a feeling with all these gas prices, that people it's going to turn negative because yeah. of this uh, great idea of high prices and we're going to have more uh, uh, people talking about it. Um, so uh, I, the good news about Proposition 30 is the guy who's running the get out the vote operation, Arlo no, Smith, Arlo Smith, I'm trying to remember Arlo's last name. He's the best get out the vote guy in the country. He's the best guy in the country. However, and, and if you go back and you look at this historically, ballot measures that are above 50% in the first field poll test, which is typically done in May or June for November, historically, 
75% of those ballot measures win, 74 and a half. Okay? Prop 30 is polled at above 50% in that first field poll. There was no polling done with an opponent campaign or opponent message first. And we know that in ballot measures, only one out of three passes. So the status quo prevails. We also know with ballot measures that the best, smartest money is spent on the no side. You don't have polling for that. You also have a competing ballot measure, Proposition 38, where she has indicated that she will spend tens of millions of dollars against that ballot measure and for her own. And we know that when there are competing ballot measures, they also divert or go to the status quo. In addition, <laughs> there are several problems here with this. In addition, those folks who want to put money against the ballot measure don't have to put it on the no side of 30. They can put it on the yes side of 38. You gave them an out to give money for education for a competing ballot measure. And uh, my students, we monitor all of the, the money and who's behind them and what's going on. And what we've seen is some money by Charles Munger, Molly's brother, on the No on 30 campaign and a lot of media attention to that. But there's a whole bunch of people who are giving yes on 30 and yes on 38. Not because they want both the pass. They want to sink them both. Which means we enter a special session that the governor has to call around education and funding and what to do with the budget right after the election in that November, December time frame. And you can't balance the budget with the catastrophic cuts just by, just on the backs of K-14 education or just higher ed. You can't do it. You can't get there. So there's going to be something dramatic if it doesn't pass. So this is a, a, a huge battle. And, and I'm, I'm very critical of the governor. He should have cleared the decks on this. He should have cleared the decks. You may have the best GOTV guy in the country, maybe in the world. That might not be enough because unions are needed and unions are focused on 32. So it's a very uh, uh, difficult set of circumstances, I think. Questions? Please. All right. <laughs> I tried to leave plenty of time for questions, so I don't know if you want to. Please. Yeah. Time of the uh, convention, Republican <coughs> convention. Yes. It occurred to me that any woman who believed that she should have any rights at all would not vote Republican. Uh, is there any any indication of what goes on with the women in this election? So the question was about uh, female voters in this election, and uh, they're the key demographic. When we talk about those thirty-five to thirty to thirty-five to forty thousand voters, if they're women, and they happen to be between forty-five, fifty-eight, or sixty, uh, and especially Hispanic. That's the key demographic that determines the election outcome. So the degree to which you talk about issues around uh, women's reproductive health, about uh, economic issues, earning power, about Lily Ledbetter. Uh, did, did the president mention Lily Ledbetter in that first debate? No. Oh, he didn't. How's he going to do it the second one? All of these are important issues for the key demographic for women. And women voted at a there are more female voters than male voters, and they voted at a huge rate for the president in 2008. If the president can carry on the likely voter Gallup numbers, so look at the likely voter Gallup numbers by gender, if he's carrying that, if he's carrying women by better than six points, he's okay. If he's carrying them by eight points or better, he's doing pretty well. So if it's six points, it's close. If it's eight points or better, he's doing really well. And he should be in that eight plus 10 point range. If he's there, he can win the presidency. He can, he can win re-election. If he's less than eight points, it's, it's much finer to get there mathematically by that likely voter. So they have to talk to them. Uh, and it's hard to do that with uh, foreign policy, I would argue, as well. Uh, Doc. Okay. I just wonder, looking at the size of this uh, voter information guide, if we should limit the number of propositions that can be on any one ballot. I mean, this is the question was about limiting the number of propositions. Yes. No. <laughs> Why would you want to do that? How much free? Uh, don't you want free speech? <laughs> you and I are the only ones that read that thing. <laughs> because if you look at title and summary, they're written this way. If you look at title and summary, you look at you know an act. An act of all that is right under the world. 
or an act to raise your taxes forever. Nobody puts that. And then you look at who signs them. And those are called short cutting cues. You look at them for partisan cues or ideological cues for how to vote. Nobody reads them, but title and summary becomes an important component to this as well. And, and just as a reminder, uh, ballot box elections, direct democracy elections in California are the second most expensive exercise, political exercise in the free world. And they're hugely expensive. And, and people want to be asked about them, and they want to vote no. That's expensive. <laughs> Do you have any uh, uh, projections um, about the uh, likelihood of, of the Democrats getting a supermajority in the California Senate? Yeah, great question. So the Democrats, uh, if, if memory serves, they have 25 seats in the California Senate. 25, I think, maybe 27. 27 to get there. Uh, they thought they would get there. I think they're going to get close. And part of the reason is, is the districts are crazy. Uh, because you only have 40 state senate districts, how they were drawn, they're much, they're, they're larger than congressional districts. They're huge. Uh, and, and they have crazy lines. Uh, you have a lot of uh, new people introducing, you have uh, introducing themselves as incumbents to voters for the first time. And the number of races that are actually uh, competitive, while quite small, and we deliver a lot of advertising and a lot of information in those districts. They don't tend to move too many voters because they're focused on the top or what's happening on the ballot measures. And, and so it's going to be Democrats two months ago, three months ago, had a better than 50% shot of getting to 27. Now it's even odds. It's even odds. Please. Yeah. Hi. I, it seems to me that the middle class at some point here has taken a real hit and have begun a downward trend relative to the, uh, the resources and their standing in their, uh, across the country. At what point did you see this begin, and what are the factors that you think brought this about? Um, the, the economic global... Uh, the, we're as tied to Europe as we are to, I would argue, Detroit. Uh, the Europeans' inability to get themselves out of the global debt crisis has prolonged America's own growth. Uh, the difficulty uh, in Asia, uh, I don't know if you've seen reports from the South Korean and how South Korean economic growth has uh, come down quite a bit from one of the surging economies uh, of Asia. This prolonged recession dragging out has led to dramatic declines in personal income for the average American. This is the Romney talking point. It's $4,300 from 2008. So you're better off now than you were four years ago? The answer is no. Is that the fault of this administration? I'll leave that for you to decide in the election. But it's clear that the president and this administration could not do all of the things that they wanted to do relative to this. And one of those things might have been a larger stimulus. A larger stimulus, which would have also been problematic for them in terms of the deficit. But I think in terms of campaigns, what you have to remember is they have the Obama team has not done, in my view, an effective job of tying the Ryan budget around the neck of Mitt Romney. They haven't done an effective job of it. Because if I show you the graphs of what the Ryan solution looks like, you'll run screaming from the room. Because you won't only have a Groupon voucher, uh, you're going to pay a lot more for a lot of things, and you're going to lose your mortgage interest deduction. And that's going to be pretty dramatic for most Americans who are in the middle or have experienced this kind of sideways malaise that's gone on for, you know, since 2007 at some level. I have one more question. Last question. And, and Rob, I'll make a plug. Rob Eiler will be here November 18th, I believe, from the Economics Department of Sonoma State. It might be a good question to ask him as well. Okay, since media buys, you bring that up. Yeah. That's the root of all evil, and we know money is the root of all evil, which I have come to believe that mind manipulation and propaganda works beyond a reasonable doubt. Is there any data to prove that? Uh, so you would go to PCL dot stanford dot edu political communication lab 
pcl.stanford.edu. This is run by Shanto Iyengar, who does phenomenal research. You can get all the campaign commercials there, English, Spanish, the whole nine yards. They're a little bit lagged. He doesn't have the Big Bird commercial, okay. uh, Obama for America, which is going to go off the air, I guess. Uh, but they will eventually, but they're running a little bit behind. But you can go to pcl.stanford.edu, and what Shanto does is he uses <laughs> humans as lab rats. <laughs> he does ex really genuine experiments about how people respond to media inputs, media buys, and the decisions that they make as a result. And there's, there's some interesting things that have come up. He's been doing this research a long time. Some things we have seen with negative campaigning, for example, is negative campaigning stimulates voters and then leaves them unfulfilled. So negative campaigning works to gin up attention, but then voters feel unfulfilled because they vote a certain way or move a certain direction, and then <laughs> it's, it's like junk food, if you want to think of it that way. But it does have an effect moving into a campaign. So if you are behind, the best thing for you to do is to go on the attack. It's very interesting. So if our data are that, the Obama, that this race is close, in trade notwithstanding, that this race is close or closing, you would expect the team that's behind or trying to maintain the lead to attack. And this is where Nielsen comes in. You can look at Nielsen and its ads, and you can see that in Florida, Obama's outspending in terms of number of ad units. He's buying a lot more ad units in Florida, in Colorado, in Iowa. Not in Wisconsin, but look at his advantage in Ohio. It's, four, it's three to one. It's four to one in Nevada, in terms of the number of ad units that they're buying. Not all of these have to be negative. They can be negative and positive, and this doesn't include the soft money or the, the Citizens United Super PAC kind of ads, which tend to be much more uh, divisive. Yeah. But what we're not sure, when voters have lots of information, that they make decisions that are dramatically different than they would have ended up anyways that the issue space is not dramatically that different. They, they may be agitated about, about it and feel unfulfilled, but it isn't clear to us that they end up in a different place with their vote than they otherwise would have gone anyways. Which is why we default to the pocketbook. We say, you know, they're down, they don't have a job, they're unemployed, they're worried about economic conditions, they see all these ads and they vote for the out, they vote for the out party, the challenger. Well, they probably would have ended up there anyways according to the pocketbook hypothesis. So, okay. What are the uh, designated uh, media areas. Yeah, yeah, the, the units, if you want to think of that one. There are Thank 13 you. major media markets in California. Sorry. Thanks so much for a wonderful presentation. Yeah.